to, to illustrate more what dynamic models can include. But more than that, I want to use it to, um, to point out uh, some ways in which dynamic models can generate data. Now this, this is going to sound odd, but one of the ways that models can inform data science is as serving as sources of synthetic data. And you may say, well, why would you want a model to serve as source of synthetic data? Because it can allow you to test inferencing strategies, and indeed study designs, to assess their vulnerabilities and their strengths. Okay? So I'm going to close this model from this morning, despite the many virtues that recommend it. And I will go open that model as well. I would ask that uh, those in the room um, summon a TA uh, if you have any problems getting this model down. You're going to have to download the file and then you're going to have to uh, unzip it. And I'll see if I can uh, show you just what I have in mind. But in the example models area, there'll be this model, opioid model C2 under bar 3, you download. And then if you unzip it, so I'm going to show this in the folder here. If you unzip it, here we go. Uh, and I go into it, I'll have to go two levels down and there's a thing, an ALP file, opioid GIS com C2. And uh, you can go into here and, and go into your downloads and, and open that up from that subfolder. Okay? Who needs help? Uh, someone need help? Who's beyond help? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, this model is a depiction of, it's a very stylized depiction of opioid related factors um, uh, related to um, opioids in Saskatchewan. Um, this is a very preliminary uh, thought piece model um, that came out of a hackathon uh, that we ran on this topic. Um, and uh, if you go to person, you will see a fairly large set of, of, of um, state charts um, depicting uh, uh, possible states people can be in with respect to different concerns as well as the system dynamics evolution concerning um, buildup of tolerance with respect to opioids. The idea being that if a person is using opioids over time, their body becomes, um, uh, for, for a given dosage of opioids, their body becomes more and more uh, adapted to, to, uh, to metabolizing it quickly and they get less of a of a bang for that dose of opioids. So they become more and more, um, uh, more and more in need to get a certain feeling of relief or a certain feeling of euphoria from a large dose. They need more and more to accommodate that. They grow less and less sensitive, if we put it informally, to this. Now, uh, this model uh, is one that, like the model this morning, is set in Saskatchewan. Um, and it depicts persons, but also dealers. Um, and if you double click on dealer, you'll see that members of dealer agents um, uh, can also be in, in different states. Some of them have to deal with movement, which I'm going to focus on last, but it has to deal with their ability, for example, to go to rural regions. Um, but then there's also a depiction of a dealer state with respect to their activity, whether they're working uh, and uh, if they're jailed or active. Um, so in which if they're incarcerated, what it posited is, it posits is they're not able to, um, to sell product in that case. If you go to person here, um, 
An individual could be a, in a disordered state or a high function state. So in a disordered state, their life is, is a mess. It's, it's, um, the desire for opioids is, is um, you know, uh, uh, causing a great deal of dysfunction and disorder in their life. Um, another key component is, is that individual in pain, in chronic pain, in no pain, or in post-operative pain. Post-operative pain would be, you know, if they went through surgery, for example, maybe it's elective surgery or major surgery for cancer, and um, and they might uh, be prescribed opioids for a period of time there, or they might be in chronic pain. In, in a chronic pain state, perhaps they're engaged in alternative pain management, or or they're um, they're they have a prescribing physician who's providing them with with opioids over time. Um, uh, over here, we have uh, some aspects of uh, their, uh, their basic situation. Are they alive? Uh, have they suffered an overdose? And if so, have, uh, do they die? Now, this relates to something that Leanne asked about this morning. This is one of several models. I've forgotten, actually, it was in this model. But where we have a sort of trans-theoretic model having to do with stages of change. So maintenance, action, preparation, contemplation, and pre-contemplation stages. And an individual may, through a sudden incident of, of overdose, for example, uh, become aware of their very mortality and, um, and uh, might, might uh, be motivated to change. I believe that was one of the, the motivations that went in there. I'll, I'll have to look at it in more detail. Individuals can be current users, either on prescribed opioids or on street drugs. You'll notice this this kind of, uh, we call it a hierarchical state chart or a compound state here, where a person's a current user in either of these states. Um, uh, but uh, uh, with street drugs, they're at greater risk because they're acquiring drugs that are less well regulated. Whereas with prescribed opioids, they're, they may be in a disordered state, um, but at least they're being prescribed dosages that are not themselves dangerous, although doubling them up, et cetera, may cause risks. Um, a person could also be a former user, in which case they could either be under treatment, um, uh, perhaps uh, receiving um, suboxone or, or some other substance, um, uh, or, or not under treatment. Um, so methadone or suboxone could be examined as, as treatment options, or there might be others. Um, interestingly, in Canada, but more recently, um, a former user, uh, I mean, more recently, uh, uh, cannabis has emerged as a, as a possible role here, as well as in managing pain. Um, the healthcare system, an individual can be outside the healthcare system or inside, in which case, you know, they'll have contact with a physician or doctor uh, over time, <coughs> outside, they may not have ready recourse to uh, a physician who could prescribe them nor, nor get them into, into treatment. And then there's some depiction of their status with respect to corrections here. Um, and and um, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's a, a depiction with respect to black market activity, which I'd have to review exactly what that is. So this is a model uh, related to opioids. It's a rather articulated model. One of the more interesting features is this buildup of tolerance that goes on over time where an individual's tolerance rises as successive doses are ingested but decays with time since, since um, using uh, opioids. So if there's a large period of opioids, their tolerance rises. And one of the risks here, of course, is if they stop using opioids, their tolerance slides. And then the dose that they could have used with barely with little effect before could kill them. And so that dynamics of tolerance capturing that was the goal of this model. Now, this is a theory about opioids. And it's a theory that can be criticized. Um, um, uh, it was inspired by much of Peter Butts' guidance and, and a lot of the discussions that came out of the boot camp captured many features. Um, but it's not particularly privileged. Uh, these individuals, these persons, take place, they circulate within a geographic environment here in Saskatchewan. Um, and here we see 
we can zoom in here. Um, dealers moving around dealing product. Um, they have contact with uh, nearby individuals um, and uh, provide them um, provide them with illegally sourced opioids. Uh, I believe these are are houses of uh, of users. And over here, you could see a report on the number of overdoses over time, um, and uh, prescription versus street acquired drug, and deaths over time from opioid overdose. Okay. But what I want to highlight here is actually something that's going on behind the scenes, something that Wade crafted in a remarkably short time. Uh, and um, for this, I'd like to stop this for a model. We could, or, or stop this for for a time. We could, um, we could incidentally go to other cities. For example, uh, I believe there's uh, Prince Albert in, in here as well, um, where we have individuals circulating in, in PA and in Regina, um, the Queen City, um, uh, with uh, with operating of dealer networks. I'd like to stop it though. And I'd like to go check something out, okay? So I'm running this model uh, out of a place that's probably different uh, from where you're running it. I'm writing, running it out of uh, a certain folder once it's stored. But you'll notice that if you go to the folder where you ran it, there's a folder called output, okay? And um, because it's... Uh, uh, because it's something which um, is, uh, is not obvious, um, I'll just uh, go provide some guidance myself. So here's opioid abuse, here we go. And here's output. And you'll notice that there's a set of files that it's produced. These files are area of the model specific. So for example, we have a death log or a legal system log, um, uh, prescription related logs, treatment related logs. Now, you may wonder about this log term, and indeed it's, it's, it's not a reference to, um, uh, to, to lumberjacks. Um, it's, it's a reference to keeping track over time of events which have taken place related to that area of the model. So if we go and we, op we open one of these, and I'll open it in a spreadsheet. We see here there's not many, um, but at time 40, a person ID overdosed and, and, and died. Um, uh, I'll go to, for example, the prescription log. Here, the, the number, as you might expect, is much larger. So uh, here, uh, different person IDs were given um, dose, were given um, uh, prescriptions by certain doctors um, at a certain level of dosing uh, and at different periods of time individuals um, uh, received those doses. If we had run it for larger we would have seen more repeats but I would note person 53 for example got an initial dose here and then was back at their doctor to acquire a new dose uh, at time 48. Um, so we see here individuals presenting and, and receiving prescriptions from their doctors over time. Um, uh, I would note that um, there's a similar, similar element here and I should really look at, those are from runs I did uh, before, um, before coming down this morning. Let me just do this for a longer run here. Ah, treatment logs. People entering and leaving treatment over time, at different times, different individuals leaving and entering treatment. Okay? Um, prescriptions here would be much more numerous in number th than I was saying uh, earlier. What this is depicting, ladies and gentlemen, is is information written out from the model on people's histories, people's biographies, their, their history of significant events. But the types of data that Wade has gathered here are similar at, at a broad level to types of data that might be available 
within the health system or legal system, justice system. So there are kind of analogs to empirical data that might be available. Now, there's several reasons that you might have to model output this. One is maybe we want to compare the sort of statistics we get out of a model, a model output like this with similar corresponding data from social services records or from justice records or indeed from, from health system records. But another reason we might output this data is because being similar perhaps in form, in the type of information, and indeed some of the patterns to what we see in the world, maybe we'd like to try using it to evolve inferencing strategies. Strategies that leverage machine learning algorithms, or that leverage computational stats to, to infer things. Now, that may seem odd, because this, this is not real world data. True. But we might expect if, if, it's a, if it's a pretty decent model, maybe it won't exactly replicate patterns in the model in the world, but maybe it will capture very important salient features in the world. More to the point yet, the model here has a distinct advantage to the world when it comes to use with data science algorithms. Ladies and gentlemen, for a model like this, in contrast to the world, we have the luxury of actually knowing what's going on in the model. So, so at a given time, if I'm running this model, and I will, I will start it up um, to, to, to illustrate this in graphical terms. Here we go. Um, so I'm going to start up this model here. And I will zoom in on our fair city. Um, and I will just note that at any one time, we could pause this model. At any one time, we could drill down over on this right-hand side. We could drill down and go look, for example, at an individual in the population. This is an individual in chronic pain. They have a prescribing physician. They have a certain ID associated with them as well, a certain identifier, which uniquely identifies them in that data set, which, which has been output. This is an individual who's in a disordered state, but does have a prescribing physician. Thank goodness they are alive. They're in the action state here with respect to stage of the train of, of change, but they're also getting street drugs. Okay. Now, my point is, in the model, to, by contrast to the real world, we actually have recourse to what, what's called in data science, ground truth information. We know precisely what's going on with this person's model. We know whether they're disordered or not, for example, right? This person in the model is disordered. If we wanted to train an algorithm that worked on data from PIP, our province's prescription maintenance system, which is used for controlled substances, amongst other things, like opioids, for restricted substances, we could we could try to create an algorithm that would allow us to, the, to use the sort of data output here by McDonaldian, um, McDonaldian uh, uh, wizardry. We could try to use this sort of information on prescription histories and on treatment to create an algorithm using this this data data that's very similar to empirical data to see if we could infer the true status that we know for that person in the model, which is that they're disordered. In the real world, we don't have the luxury of knowing for absolute certainty whether someone's disordered or not. And so training an algorithm to be a really good at recognizing disordered people is kind of hard because we, we don't know when it's really good. Um, sure, we have some ways of trying to deal with that, but we often don't, don't have that real ability to know, okay, this is a case that's disordered, let's see if it recognizes that that's a case where we know they're not disordered, let's make sure it doesn't predict they are. Here in the model we know this, so we can train in a model algorithm on the type of data we do have uh, available empirically and see if it correctly predicts the true underlying situation, which we don't have empirically, but we do have in the model. 
We know in the model this person is disordered. We could look at their data that they've given us over time about their treatment history, perhaps, and their prescription log. And we could see, using this data, would our machine learning algorithm to predict whether they're disordered or not work well? Would it, using, using only data that we, have, uh, that we have empirically, the type of data we have empirically, as generated from the model, using that type of data, can it actually predict their true underlying st status in the model? And if, if not, why not? Where is its vulnerability? Where is it not able to predict their true underlying status? Where is it falling flat in terms of its inference? That can allow us to spot oversights, vulnerabilities of machine learning algorithms in terms of their ability to, to spot the underlying situation. And it can allow us to evolve more savvy machine learning algorithms, ones that are less likely to, to mess up on certain classes of cases. So this whole idea of having a model that outputs, I mean, after all, I can go in and look at anything in this model. I have a God's eye view of the model, as it's sometimes said. I know exactly what's going on in this model. That's great, but the question is, if I only, if I run a test with a machine learning algorithm using just the sort of data I have empirically, how good would my inferences be in inferring that true situation in the model that I know? Because in the real world, I don't know the true situation. All I have is recourse to this sort of information. If I can, with all data, go from this sort of information to the true underlying status, then in the real world where I don't have the true underlying status, maybe my algorithm will be pretty good at inferring it. Because if I do it in the model, maybe we'll be pretty good at inferring it. And if the model, if our inference algorithm, our support vector machine, or our logistic regression, or our um, HMM, or what have you, if it can't, deduce from the sort of data I have empirically uh, from the world as generated by the model, if it if it's consistently makes mistakes, we can work to say, OK, what is it that's confusing it? What is it that's causing it problems? And work to remedy those problems, because we might legitimately be afraid that it'll make those same sort of mistakes in with real world data. So this is a situation where we're using dynamic models because we have this God's eye view. We know exactly what the situation is to evaluate, to test in the crucible of data like we have empirically to test, do those machine learning algorithms work well in inferring the underlying situation, which is often what we want to know in the world. We can refine those algorithms, help head off common problems in those algorithms. And therefore, when we're going to apply algorithms on real world data, we'll be much more savvy. We won't be tripped up by little mistakes that, because we will have spotted those mistakes when they're trying to operate on synthetic data. And critically, we can circulate such synthetic data without pr any privacy concerns. We can circulate this data as the basis for refining algorithms. This is data like we have from the real world. It has all sorts of rich patterns in it that are non-obvious, emerging from a non-linear model. We can circulate it, and there's no privacy encumbrances on this. There's no, there's no real world people there. All there are these folks circulating, and, 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 and they'll, they'll be fine with us circulating it. It's no problem. They have no, no ethical issues associated with it. Um, if we want, we can go through a simulated ethical review process. <laughs> but, um, but the fact is, there's no ethical encumbrances on this sort of data because it's it's fake data. Yeah, no, don't don't use that as the same word as fake news. But it's it, it's fake data. This is fake data, so we don't have to worry about ethical concerns with it, and we can test it against ground truth, synthetic ground truth. So this is what I call synthetic ground truth study. Is taking data similar to what we have in the world and seeing if our methods can infer the true 
the, the synthetic ground truth in the model accurately. And if they can't, maybe it's because they have problems that will cause real world problems when applied to real world data as well. Okay? Um, does that make sense to people as an approach? It's a very powerful use of these models. It's, if I may say, a pretty straightforward use of these models. Wade did it within remarkable time. I never would have expected it. But the fact is that um, we, can, we can generate this data with, uh, uh, in, in, a ready, in a ready way with little problem, um, with, with some McDonaldian um, talent. And by so doing, we, we can arrive at rich data for trying evolving our algorithms, but also for studying the vulnerabilities of our algorithms, the limitations, for studying their accuracy, for, for refining them. So when they encounter real world data, they're much more savvy, much stronger, and more informed algorithms. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. It would help me understand how this works if I saw how it didn't work. Yeah. Sure. Does that make sense? Like how this yeah. doesn't actually, uh, how you, you realize, oh my gosh, there's a problem. Yeah. With, with an algorithm, or with an yeah. uh, inference algorithm. Yeah. Good. Okay, we'll see if we can show that. Yeah. I'll get one of my students working on it. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, because th there, are, there are many times where we think a machine learning algorithm will work well, but we, we, we actually find that it has problems. This is a situation where we can actually identify when it has problems, where if we're working on data in the real world, often we won't know that it, it had a problem. And I'll see if we can come up with a, a nice little example. We certainly have done those in the past, and we might be able to try out one we've already done, or do something with this one to, um, to illustrate it with the sort of a, a simple model like this. Yeah? Any other, thank you for that suggestion. I'll, I'll act on that. Other questions? I guess traditionally, um, the operation of research people would say, where do we do sensitivity analysis in some of your, your modeling? And, and, and what, did you, what insights did you find? And I'll ask Ray that question. Yeah, so sensitivity analysis is a routine part of our system science modeling approach. And uh, it's actually one of the things I was referring to earlier when I talked about prioritizing prioritizing data cleaning priorities. Um, because sensitivity analysis uh, will highlight whether a given type of input, um, as well as other sorts of variables in the model, um, uh, whether a small variation in that will cause a big change. And if so, data quality issues in that, in that input, for example, may spell big differences in the output that would be generated, right? And then if you use real world data yes. to refine the model. That's right, that's right. So you, you might then put the effort, for example, into uh, gathering uh, higher quality data or, uh, or a broader set of data that could shed light on this issue to which it's really sensitive. And we've done exactly that in some of our models. I mean, literally it's made, you know, the difference to shelling out, um, I remember in one case, twelve to $15,000. We actually saw the model's very sensitive to this. It's a key assumption and we need more information on it. And the model helped us realize that that was, that was uh, a more important decision to invest on, on collecting data on than another. And it actually led us to put down uh, a major sum of money to, to acquire data that would let us answer that, uh, to let us estimate it with much finer, finer degree. And so sensitive analysis is something that Wade's done on, on many models of uh, child infectious disease, for example. Um, and it's, it's an absolutely critical process when it comes to, to system science uh, modeling um, as, as we practice it. So, any other questions? Long day. So, um, I think we're 
essentially out of time. I want to thank you for your patience uh, today. Tomorrow we're going to be diving into a, the first of a series of methodological explorations related to techniques that we use to, to join together data science and system science. The first technique will be a technique that by itself is actually somewhat arguably a system science, uh, uh, science uh, technique. It's, it's something called hidden markup model. But it's a very powerful tool. It is a dynamic tool. And it's a tool which, if we understand it, and it's a little bit more accessible than some of the later tools in terms of immediate appreciation, if we understand it, it will help us understand the later tools because it's a first big step towards the basic reasoning that plays out in the later tools. So we're going to see hidden markup models. And then we're going to go on from there to particle filtering. And hidden markup models sort of give a little bit of a, a they give a glimpse of a lot of the key thinking that goes on into that goes on with particle filtering, but in a simpler context. So we're going to see how hidden Markov models can help us infer an underlying situation given very noisy, sparse data of different sorts. How we can triangulate from multiple lines of evidence to point to an underlying truth of what's going on over time. We will then launch into the very exciting approach a particle filter, um, which is going to provide an anchor by which to constantly reground models, dynamic models, in observations in a way that goes well beyond what is achieved through traditional approaches like calibration. It will reground them in a way that will keep them current, that will help them learn from new evidence, and that will help them be always ready to project forward with, uh, with increasing confidence, but more significantly yet, to ask what if questions about alternative policy regimens in a way that takes into account all the most recent data and our, most, and our sense of where we're at right now. It turns models from being one-time snapshots that are produced and then decay in value, become increasingly disconnected with the world, to to, to instruments that can be kept always ready, a platform as it were, to always be ready to ask about, um, about the impacts of intervention, okay? So that's tomorrow, starting tomorrow morning. And we'll see a number of case studies associated with those techniques over the course of the next two days. So we get to see the sausages made, shall we? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, very good. Thank you very much for your patience, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock.